for folks that uh, purchase memberships and support the museum, for uh, just uh, friendly faces to visit, and also to our volunteers. We have a great volunteer corps. We have a very small staff here at, at the City of Museum. It's like six or seven of us, and uh, it's tough to run a place this big with all these cars and activities on that handful of people. So we rely tremendously on volunteers. You see them, they pretty much are wearing blue. I'm wearing green today because I'm with the underdog. But uh, typically we're Simeon Blue, and if you see our uh, guys and a couple gals walking around, give them a thumbs up or thank you because hard to run this place without that kind of help. We only have a uh, very few people, but the rest of the guys, if I start naming, I'd name so many uh, important names here, but we have guys running the front desk, uh, running the gift shop, uh, not just pretzels, but all kinds of things around here. We have to maintain this big place. So thank you to the volunteers. Please. And of course, thank you to Dr. Sidney, of course. So let's uh, start our program. We are talking about Le Mans, 1959. And uh, this has been on our schedule. You know, we go through our demo days uh, a year early and start making up our list. And then last week, if you notice, we have the books. We, we have for sale books. You can sit down in the cafe there and read them or uh, go up to the gift shop and take one home. And I'm looking through there, and there's a, a book by Sterling Moss on 1959, The Moms. So uh, just in time, I had to crush through that book, but it's a fun read. If you see that in there, you should grab that. So uh, let's uh, let's take a quick look at our cars here, and that's what we call scrutineering. It's just a little technical look at, at our uh, middle of the day. So let's see what we have. There we go. Have to see what I'm aiming at. So anyway, we start with the Jaguar D-Type right here. Uh, exciting, wonderful car, favorite of many of ours. And there we go. Uh, so uh, cast iron block, six cylinder in the line, twin rubber can, three and a half liters. However, after the 1959 and 1955 Lamar, tremendous action and 80 people killed. The uh, organizers uh, reduced displacement down to three liters. Uh, they changed you know, the rules for 1956. And in fact, 1956, Lamar wasn't even on the sports car championship calendar, where Lamar was a race that he won on the sports car for the championship to count for double points. So here it is in 56, not even on the count. It was still a race, but not on the sports car championship. And uh, uh, displacements are reduced to three liters, so here we are, three liter cars for 1959. Uh, we have four speed gearbox, of course, it's a Moss gearbox. Uh, not not four wheel independent suspension, it's a live axle in the back. Keep in mind what this car is built for. Le Mans, uh, they almost didn't enter other things. They, they, didn't, they never went after the championship. They were after Le Mans. Winning the championship is great. Ferrari was the master of it. But if you just won Le Mans, you took all the press. You, the wind right out of the sails of the champion. The Le Mans winner got the news, and the Le Mans winner sold cars. So Bill Lyons from Jaguar, he was after Le Mans, not much else, and the cars were built for Le Mans. Uh, alloy body, and of course, that's the important thing about this body, is it's monocoque. It uh, will see tubular chassis in these cars, and over there we actually have a monocoque. And I'm just gonna close this door tight while I see it. So that's big news in a sports car. Remember Mercedes in the early 50s, and they're giving us space frame and fuel injection and full independent and some pretty hot stuff. And you could buy that in a road car, 300 SL. But going to a monocoque is really, that's jumping into the future of Malcolm Sayer. He's an aircraft designer out of World War II comes on with Jaguar and he's not just going aerodynamic, but he's going aer aeronautic, you know, airplane technology with that kind of construction. Light, rigid, strong. And uh, 350 horsepower, that sounds high. I think it's more like 270, 280. Um, as we moved along, they start out around 250. But uh, as we travel along and we get, we have three Webers, you know, the C-Jag starts with two SUs and we have Webers. Ultimately, fuel injected, the Lucas fuel injection, no snickering, and uh, the power was going up and up all the time, and on the RD Jaguars. 
Okay, a little front suspension, independent front, of course. Uh, by A arms, you see its rack and pinion, you see the bellows on the steering rack. But the big news there that you're looking at is the disc brake. And uh, four wheel disc brakes, Jaguar Force and 51 at Le Mans are running disc brakes. Ferrari, we're still on drums right up to uh, by about 1960. So big news there, running disc brakes. And what's the advantage? Well, as you're running a race and brakes are getting hot, uh, as they heat up, the brakes are gassing and you get, uh, that actually lessens the contact of the brake to its, its friction surface and you, uh, your braking phase. If you go back, if some of us are old enough, if you had drum brake American cars and you race them around back in the day, uh, the guys with the drum brake cars, they'd be pulling off and saying, I'm done, I have no more brakes, I had an MG, it's like, what are you guys talking about? I don't know if brakes went away from you, but guys would have to stop forcing around, the brakes were done. So Jaguar on disc brakes, which was a big deal. And uh, my need technical help, there we go. So uh, here we see the uh, oiling system, we have an oil core, and important thing on the D-type is we want a low car. Malcolm Sayer is an aerodynamist, he wants a low car. Get that engine down low, even leaned it over a little bit. Took the sump off the bottom. Now we have a fuel, uh, an oil tank remotely, so we have this dry sump engine where we're pumping oil to the engine from a remote tank, getting a lower car, and you'll even see that the bump on the hood is offset to one side. It's all about aerodynamics on that car. And there we just see the, uh, uh, the rear differential, and the body, the body is a center section that is our monocoque, and we have uh, a, a rear section bolted on, a front section bolted on, on pulling suspension, holding the engine. So it's just added to it. When you see the hood up, and you see some struts running out, no, it's, it's not because it's a tube chassis, it's, that's a bolted on attachment to hold the engine and front suspension. And here's that wonderful engine. And why wonderful, why do we point out this engine so much? Because it's a passenger car engine. Jaguar comes out with this engine in 1949 with twin air brake cam and uh, inline six, and it's just tremendous. They go racing at Le Mans, yeah. they're winning at Le Mans with basically a passenger car engine. Ferrari is out there killing it, they're winning the sports car championship, but that's a special purpose built engine that would cost a fortune to put into a passenger car. You'd have to have a very high priced car, which of course Ferraris, when you could buy a passenger car Ferrari, they were very pricey. Jaguars were cheap. You could buy um, Jaguars for the price of uh, Corvette and such, so they weren't like a high priced car. Of course, buying a, a, a race car like a C-Type or a D-Type, that's different, but the factory wasn't gonna sell you or I one of those, they, they went to racers. And a little more suspension. And then moving on to the Testarossa. So there's a beauty, has that body by Scaglietti with the cutaways and uh, now I made a few of those and they want to a, a more normal looking design that's looking for maybe more airflow around the brakes. So uh, let's see what our specs are. Well there we see the drum brakes as we point out the difference from the D-Type which is already running on four wheel disc and we're running on four wheel drum. It uh, sounds maybe backward but when you perfect something and it's working and they do work well, the other guy has an advantage but there's also a disadvantage to new technology. Sometimes it fails. So Ferrari sit back and let them prove it out. Uh, let it get developed. They have a well-developed drum brake system and Ferrari sticks with it. So we have three liters V12. Uh, That's pretty pretty hot, but Ferrari had a penchant for the V12. And uh, in the board stroke there, four-speed gearbox and 300 horse. So really exquisite car. And you love how they sound when you have all those cylinders on it. So there's our engine. Uh, of course, it's all very lightweight. Uh, this is not a passenger car engine. The Ferrari engine is a thoroughbred piece of work. We see the sump down below, all thinned in aluminum for cooling. Uh, up on top, super cool, we have that row of Weber carburetors downdraft. And in fact, on these cars, they moved the spark plugs outboard and so they could have that interesting and efficient carburetor setup. Now the spark plugs are on the outside with the exhaust manifolds. And we see even the gearbox is uh, beautifully made with uh, cooling fins, four-speed, of course. 
and then a Colombo engine to point that out. So there's a, the auto, I think that's an auto weeks cutaway there. And uh, there we see the chassis. So big news, monocoque and the Jaguar. The Ferrari is on not a space frame, but a tubular frame. Uh, we see a little bit of uh, stepping towards space frame with the triangulation and such. A space frame is when all of your uh, angles are very carefully uh, figured out to uh, not have anything but tension on your tubes. You don't have a tube under pressure where it can bend. It's a long tension. Sometimes maybe compression, and that would be a space frame. So moving up to the DVR-1, and does it get prettier than that? Not for a British car. So specs, uh, alloy body, super lightweight. Uh, with this car, uh, we like to say if you lean on it with your fingertips, you're gonna have 10 dents in that car. So super lightweight. Uh, I love the wheels, we're on alloy wheels here as we are on the other cars. And in the Jaguar's case, uh, alloy disc wheels, and then Barani's here. <laughs> These must be done up on the Aston. So a uh, tubular space frame uh, where all of our frame is carefully constructed with uh, engineering behind and everything and tubes are in tension or in compression or avoiding bending forces on the tube. Uh, make it stronger and lighter and I think we'll have a, a photo of just the frame and you'll see how light that is. If you really do things correctly, you can see a tremendous amount of weight and make it strong or stronger. So three liter in line, six cylinder, similar to the Jaguar, to under red cam. And a five speed gearbox in this case, they don't use it in every race, but at Le Mans, that's a useful thing at Le Mans. 250 horsepower. David Brown, of course, is the managing director. And uh, there's a little uh, diagram of the cockpit. You look in there, it's pretty aircraft looking with all these switches, and uh, you can see what everything does. So study that, you're ready to take it out. Okay, there's a nice cutaway, but I think we have a nice chassis cutaway coming up. There's that beautiful engine, the Weber carburetors on one side, flowing across the cylinder head to go out the exhaust. And that's the... Okay, I didn't see a chassis picture, but I think maybe in our presentation we'll see one. And uh, just super lightweight, very rigid, and then moving on to the... Uh, 250 GT Ferrari. So there are specs again, three liter, 1959. It's a three liter race for the for this class. 12 cylinders, um, three Weber carburetors, drum brakes of course, five speed gearbox, and 240 horse. It says here. I'm having trouble with my clicker. And uh, pictures here from the brochure. Gus, are you in the room? Well, Gus, uh, I saw Gus around. Gus is helping us out today. He um, he goes to the library, and with Ryan, our librarian, they do research and find images. And in many cases, it's just go to the brochure cabinets and pull out the uh, brochure. You wouldn't believe that there are brochures on cars that they would make a handful of, but there are. Of course, the Ducks and Young has them, and they're just gorgeous. So these are brochure photos. But what do we see in this picture? we see a pretty simple chassis layout. It's tube frame, but nothing like a space frame. And of course, one full engine for the B12. So uh, that's uh, kind of our technical look at the cars. Uh, we're look looking at some real pure racing machine right here. We have uh, E-Type, 250TR, DBR1, and a uh, 250 GT, so cars that we love, and we're going to have them back after we do our presentation. But let's tell you what's happening here in the Sydney Museum. Uh, Will, you have any good news for us? We always have good news. Hey guys, uh, thank you all so much for coming out today. We really appreciate it. Uh, we get some great cars, and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, but before we start out with demo day, we're just going to make some announcements. Uh, first and the first uh, thing I should let you guys know about is if you go back towards the tent, we have actual oil for sale from the from uh, the DBR1. What other cars do we have over there, Caddy? D-Type and a Testarossa. Okay, and the D-Type and a Testarossa. So if uh, you want to get some genuine oil from any of these cars, all the proceeds go and benefit the museum. Uh, it's a great uh, 
a great gift for your favorite car lover. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, we have you available right back on the, uh, the, the tent there. All right, and, oops, let's back it up. All right, uh, so our next demo day isn't gonna be for a few weeks. Uh, because in two weeks from today, uh, we're having our third Philly NNL model car show. It's been happening on March 11th. So if you are into model cars, if you're a builder, uh, you know, come come stop by. Uh, we get crowds of hundreds and hundreds of, of you know, uh, hardcore fans. There's a lot of great uh, models here. So if that's your thing, you know, definitely make sure to check it out. It's happening on March 11th. Our next demo day uh, is happening on March 25th, two weeks from then. It's Sebring 1965. Uh, when it rains, it pours. I'm sure if you guys are race fans, you guys know about the story of Sebring in 1965, torrential downfall. You know, but we keep racing, we don't stop. So uh, we're gonna have some of you know your favorite cars out that day: the Daytona Coupe, the Grand Sport, the GT40. So you know, you know, if uh, you like uh, you know that kind of story and that kind of theme, you know, check it out. It's gonna be a great day with some great cars. Our big announcement. Uh, you know, if you've been to the museum the last couple weeks, you probably heard us uh, talk about this. Uh, we're going to be talking about it uh, uh, incessantly because we're very excited about it. it. Is June 10th and June 11th, we're doing the 24 Hours of Simeon. Okay, so basically, what you're seeing today, as far as the demo day, we're going to repeat that 24 times. You know, over the course of a, a full day, we're going to be running 36 different cars over that 24-hour period. Okay, so either cars that were in Le Mans or of the type that were raced at Le Mans. We're going to have guest cars. We're going to have special speakers that are coming in. We're going to have uh, cut-ins from the live race. We're going to be telecasting the race that day. You know, we're, we're not telling you to bring sleeping bags and cots, but we're bringing sleeping bags and cots, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, there's going to be more information, a dedicated website uh, that's going to be launching next week. So if you check our social media and you follow us along on our regular website, all the information will be there, but it's going to be a great event. We're, we're looking for sponsors. We're looking for guest cars. We're looking for just a lot of fun. So if you guys are into Le Mans, if you want to see something crazy, if you guys want to see maybe us three o'clock in the morning, I don't know, just uh, put one of these into a pole. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, check it out. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun, and uh, you know, it's a in celebration of the, the hundredth year anniversary of Le Mans. So. Uh, check it out. It's, it's, we're going to have a blast that day for sure. So I'll uh, let Kevin get back to you here. And uh, thanks again. Thank you, Will. And uh, yes, 24 hours of Simeon. We're celebrating 100 years. Uh, wow, I can't believe that went by so fast. Uh, we're also celebrating, of course, Dr. Simeon. Dr. Simeon passed away literally while he was here in Philly, but literally in the middle of the race, right in the middle of Le Mans 24 hours last year is when we lost Dr. Simeon. It was also right after his birthday. So uh, we're going to celebrate his birthday and Le Mans together. Uh, also, that oil, boy, that looked real nice, but that's some pricey oil. Ken, what are they? 50 bucks, I think. So it's a $50 donation to the museum for a couple drops of used oil. So if that doesn't sound like a good deal, I don't know what is. So anyway, our, our story today is another Le Mans story. We're going to be telling you with Le Mans stories. Yeah, we have to kind of see you reading, but we're, we're really going heavy on Le Mans this year. You probably have already noticed it's Le Mans, Le Mans, Le Mans. But when you walk through this museum, there are a couple of things that you notice. One, you should right away realize, oh, these are all sporting cars. And yes, it's a museum about the, the racing sports cars. And you say, well, some of these cars could use a paint job. Uh, preservation, it's a big secondary theme with us. Dr. Simeon, always a preservationist through his 50 years of collecting. He would choose the unrestored car over the restored car if he had a choice. Although, really, his first choice would be originality. But he won cars with original bodies. So many of these type of cars, the cars we're looking at right here, they get rolled, they get crashed, they get burned, and they get rebuilt. In their heyday while they're racing, this car was on fire during the race. They saved it. <laughs> I don't know if they got it back up in the same race. But that was just a common thing. So Dr. Simeon, he wanted cars that were sound original components. That was important to him. Uh, and then original finishes whenever possible. So definitely strong themes going through the museum. Now let's, uh, so, oh, and, and Le Mans, big theme here. We, we could take, I think, half the cars on the floor here and put them all in Le Mans row. Uh, because Le Mans was just the biggest sports car race in the world 
of all car racing in the world. Uh, you could argue Le Mans is the biggest race in the world. Indy 500, that could be a challenge, but Le Mans, it's right at the top, and it's certainly beyond any other sports car race, even though there are tremendous sports car races. The Mille Miglia is the first one that comes to mind, a thousand miles on public roads in Italy. But Le Mans was the feather in your cap. If you won, as Dr. Simeon liked to say, it was like winning the Super Bowl. And winning Le Mans, the driver's names went down in history. Everybody knows you know, the drivers of these cars. You know the marks. And that's why Bill Lyons, all he cared about was winning Le Mans. They, they didn't enter many of the other races. They certainly didn't go after the championship. But they won Le Mans, and they did it consistently in the 1950s, and that sells cars. So it's a very big deal to win Le Mans. So let's see what we have here with our underdog champion. Well, our underdog champion, we're talking about Aston Martin in this case. So if you're wearing green today, you're with the underdog, you're, you're a Philly guy. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Le Mans 24. Team managers know this is tough. The manufacturers tend to know this is tough. Everybody knows it's tough except Henry Ford. He found out. So uh, here we go, leading up to 1959. And uh, I can see my screen over here. So uh, Aston Martin has been going after it. David Brown, who takes over the com company, he's very serious about uh, competition, and he wants this Le Mans win. David Brown, he's, he's, he builds tractors and what have you. I think he's a lot in the mold of, of Bill Lyons, and he knows if, if if he can win Le Mans, not only is it a huge you know boost to your personal ego and such. But he, he's a manufacturing guy. He can turn that maybe in, in some ways to his advantage commercially as well. So um, they're running the DB3S. It's a beautiful car. It looks very much like this, especially when you see them in the Aston Martin green. It's a metallic soft green. That's Aston Martin green. Uh, they get moss on board. Um, they're just not doing it, though. They're not, uh, you know, they're doing OK, but they're not getting the job done. They're not winning them all. They're not uh, threatening the championship. And uh, the DB3 is a wonderful car, but we have um, uh, William uh, Everhorst's uh, assistant. He kind of goes around his boss to John Wire and suggests that we redesign and come out with a new car, a lighter car. So after the DB3S uh, just doesn't do it at Le Mans, they uh, go back to the drawing board and we come up with a DBR1. So, uh, uh, it's been well with the DBR1. But oh, we'll look back at Jaguar there. So we see the, uh, right here, that's Jaguar bragging. That's what Jaguar puts out after winning Le Mans again. And well, they had 1951, 1953, 55, 6, 7. That's really doing the job. We have Mercedes winning in 52 when, when the, when the uh, Jaguars. Uh, end up DNFing, you know, they have oiling problems and overheating problems, and Jaguar takes that win. And uh, Ferrari right in the middle there with a, a win in 1954, which is also a championship win for them. And as we said earlier, Le Mans, you could have double points in, in the championship from Le Mans. Uh, what do we have here? Oh, there's more uh, Jaguar bragging. And, uh, yep, they're just going after Le Mans. We don't see them bragging about other events because they weren't doing much of other events. So in 1958, we have a Ferrari win. We have Jaguar cleaning up through the 50s. Jaguar actually kind of quits. They hand over cars to teams that are competing at carrier costs, notably who wins Le Mans with them. Cunningham team are running the Jaguars. But Jaguar is now sitting this out. It's a very expensive thing. They were in it to accomplish something which they did at Le Mans repeatedly. Ferrari is in the game for a different reason. He's just a competitor. Win or lose, Ferrari's going to be in the battle forever. And uh, talking about getting out of the battle, one of our heroes uh, is uh, Jean Vienne, who has teamed up with Phil Hill. They win in 58, they teamed up again for 59, even though Jean Vienne's wife is trying to get him to retire. He's had Two dozen uh, acquaintances, friends, co-competitors that have died just in his time of racing. Two dozen. That's uh, that's insane. And he has children, and the wife wants him to quit. But he's in our game for 1959.
ultimately the tires jump beyond the tires after four Le Mans wins. Okay, so there we go. Now we're looking at the championship. Championship is Ferrari's world. 1953 is when the World Sports Car Championship begins, and it's won by Ferrari, and they repeat. And what do we have? We have a break in 55 with Mercedes. Of course, uh, uh, Moss wins the uh, uh, Millimilia for Mercedes. The cars are amazing, technically superior, and they win the championship, but after that Le Mans accident, they're, they retire. So Mercedes gets out of the picture, and they're not in a race for 1959. But uh, 56 championship, 7, 8, it's Ferrari all day. They also go on, they win the 62, 63, 64, finally in 65, the, uh, our uh, Shelby Cooper over there, the Shelby Coops win the GT championship in, in 65, first time for an American car. That's another story. So uh, here we have Ferrari coming to look to repeat the 1958 win. And of course, hopefully the championship as well. That's, I, I would think that's more important to Ferrari than even the Le Mans win. But the Le Mans win is important for the championship. So they're there and they're serious. So Phil Hill, Jean Bien again, our team. And how about Aston Martin? Well, they fall short of a couple of Le Mans, almost second place. Um, but they have, oh, and uh, I think uh, second place in the, in the championship as well, behind Ferrari, of course. And uh, by the way, the cars from the, that are winning the championship Ferrari are like the 375 Millimilia, you can see it right in Le Mans Row, 250TR. These cars win the 54, uh, TR in 58. And uh, who do we have for us? We have Reg Parnell as team manager, John Myers is on board with them. And uh, they are serious about Le Mans. It's, uh, it's uh, David Brown's team. There's that picture of the uh, chassis that we being interested in. Look how light that looks. I, I think one person could carry that. It's uh, all small diameter tubes, and they're arranged in a way for maximum strength, and that's one we start calling it the space chassis, the space frame. And then, of course, the beautiful lightweight body. And there's Reg Parnell. Reg had uh, been a driver. He was with Van Wall before Aston Martin. And uh, let's see what he's got for wins. 1950 Goodwood Trophy, 55 Silverstone. And uh, interesting, a funny thing with him, he, uh, he went into Formula One when Formula One was brand new and they had the first Formula One race and Parnell's in it, 1947. And it's a uh, clean sweep for the British. Uh, three ERAs win. ERA, English Racing Automobile. They're the only three that even finished. So clean sweep for the Brits. And their chief rivals, the French, where were they? They're stranded on a ship, stuck in ice. So that was an easy day. An easy day for the Brits in the first Grand Prix race. But he, he's a team manager of Aston Martin in 1959. And uh, John Wire, uh, we know him much later with uh, four GTs and the Jaguars. And uh, he just had a great career as well. So 12 hours of Sebring, we have uh, Ferrari beginning their championship season with a nice one-two finish at Sebring. Keep in mind, you finish second, you finish third, these are more points. You don't just get points for finishing first. How your cars get through the field are very important for a championship. Aston Martin, they did well at Nürburgring. See that, there we go. So 1,000 kilometers at Nürburgring. We have Moss in 59 winning for the second time, and it's the third time in a row for Aston Martin's to win at uh, the Nürburgring, 1,000 kilometers. It's on the championship calendar. So uh, they uh, managed to keep in the running by taking this one. So there we go. You can probably, probably click the five pass wherever it will be. So uh, 1959, now, now we're, uh, we're, we have Le Mans coming up after Nürburgring. And uh, it's just a, a few weeks later, of course, Aston Martin is all excited after a win, beating the heavy opposition to go and try to do it again with the big shot. And maybe you can advance me. Oh, there we go. So uh, one of our heroes, Sterling Moss, he's on the Aston Martin team. Moss is also driven for Jaguar, he's driven for Mercedes. Remember, he won the 
the uh, Mel Melia from Mercedes from 55. Uh, this is typical of the era. Now we're used to uh, certain names being attached to certain marks because they raced with them so, so long. You know, you say Schumacher, Ferrari, right? These guys, they stay with, with teams now. Uh, Christensen, right? You, you, you only think of one car when you think of our Lamont heroes and our champions. But in Moss's day, these guys bounced around. Uh, whoever offered them the best deal, the best ride, whatever suited their desires and whatever deal they could make. And so Moss, he's, now he's with Aston Martins. And of course, uh, he's really, uh, as a young man with Jaguar, really showed the way uh, winning. So he's with Jaguar for 51 and 54, Mercedes 54 and 56, Maserati, uh, Aston Martin, there's a Lotus, and he drove for anybody and anything. He drove every weekend. If you had a Formula 2 race, he'd jump in it. If, if you're racing saloon cars, he'd jump in it. So, community and everything. But, uh, uh, definitely, we want to say two times one in the, uh, with Aston Martin and the Newburgh Ring, and that's the third one for Aston Martin. Okay, uh, one little side story on Moss. So Moss is competing also in you know, Formula, and one of his main competitors, another Brit, Mike Hawthorne, and uh, you know it's all about points, and they're in a, a points contested championship race, and Hawthorne uh, spins out, he's facing the wrong way in the course, the car is stalled, and Moss, in the, from you know, as a competitor, but he's shouting over to Hawthorne, he's like, yeah, we just rolled in and bump started, and there are very stringent rules about what you can do out on the track. But uh, Hawthorne lets the car all the way, bump starts, gets back in the race, and he's um, he's flagged for this uh, after the race. It's uh, a, there's a, a penalty, uh, you know, and uh, Moss defends him uh, about what happened, and Hawthorne gets the points for whatever he finished in the race. Hawthorne ends up winning the uh, championship over Moss. Moss had won four races and Hawthorne, I think, had won one. Moss had won, you know, uh, plenty more races. But Hawthorne was ahead by one point and he got the championship. And another part of that story is they're in the race and Hawthorne is uh, leading and they, they, the Moss's pit shows a, a sign saying uh, where, what, what Moss needs to beat him. Moss needs to set a fastest lap because you ask for championship points. He misreads the sign and he doesn't he doesn't go for fastest lap. Hawthorne had the fastest lap. So Moss loses that championship. A championship he never achieved. Of all the great drivers, something like all the great British drivers, he's the one that never won a championship that we consider him to be a champion. So there's Jack Fairman. He, he's uh, co-driving with Moss and in this race at 59 Le Mans. But they've co-driven co together in other events, uh, the Arbor Ring. And Fairman is like Mr. Steady. He's reliable. He doesn't get in trouble. So Moss, with Moss you have the speed, with Fairman you have reliability, and so that they make a, a fine team. And uh, Moss wins also with him in the Taurus Trophy. So uh, they team up well together. Uh, one thing sometimes is personalities can be a problem in racing. You might have one guy in the car, but you have two guys sharing a car in these endurance races, and personalities can uh, lead to issues. There's, of course, Carol Sharp, uh, Shelby, our own American Texas chicken farmer. And there's Shelby. And Boy Salvadori teamed up with Shelby. So uh, Shelby Salvadori racing with uh, Aston. Shelby has a little bit of a thing with Ferrari. Uh, they've spoken about Shelby maybe coming on the Ferrari team and there are some issues. So uh, Shelby already has a little bit of a drive, so a little chip on his shoulder regarding Ferrari. But he's, he's in a car that they're hoping to compete well. And Roy Salvadori partnered with Shelby. So there we see him with the Ferrari across and Aston Martin. Uh, interesting thing with, with both of these fellows, they both, both passed away within, I think, a month of each other. Uh, I'm having trouble with that. Okay, Maurice Trintignant, also on our, uh, on our team. So uh, 
Uh, here we have him winning the 54 Taurus Trophy, 55 and 85 Monaco, I don't know about that. And 1953, uh, 54, he's at Le Mans. Okay. Anyway, he's with uh, uh, all kinds of great outfits. He's with uh, Maserati, Ferrari, Aston Martin, Porsche, as we've seen in this time. These guys move around. Uh, one thing he had a, a nickname, his uh, nickname was Le Petit Le. And he got that because he owned a, a Bugatti that he raced on his own, it was stored in the barn, and after the war, he uh, was prepping his Bugatti for uh, the Coupe de Liberation. It's like the first big race after the war. And he has problems with the car, the fuel filter is plugged with rat droppings. Yeah. And so he gets this nickname, the Petulant, and it's the rat droppings man. How'd you like to carry that with you? But that's uh, Maurice Fontignan. And there's uh, Paul Ferrer, and he's, he's uh, runs in the championship. He has uh, 11 uh, Formula One points. And uh, let's see what we have on him. We have him with Porsche in the 50s, Aston Martin, Jaguar, Aston Martin's uh, Ferrari. So he's all over, and he has a 1960 Le Mans man in the future. So Paul Ferrer, also in our race. And then let's talk about the Jaguar team. So. We have uh, Jaguar now dropped from three and a half liters to three liters. The factory is out. The cars are with uh, private teams, the Courier Cost notably, who had won the model with them previously, and Lister. Now we have uh, some special body Jaguar engine cars. So Frank Costin designing some uh, very slippery and fast Jaguar uh, engine cars. So uh, we're looking for Jaguars to be very fast on the Mulsanne, faster than ever. And of course, we already know they're reliable. You can't win the Mons with the Jaguar, you do win the Mons with the Jaguar. Okay, there's the Ferrari team. So that's the Ferrari factory team, but we also have privateers. We have like five uh, privateers in the race as well. So Ferrari is looking very strong. Why so strong? They're reliable. They finish races. Aston Martin has had problems in the past. Ferrari finishes races, and they're the fastest car in the race. They are fastest in practice. And Moss with uh, Aston's in his book, he says, it, um, I think this is going to be a Ferrari's race, but Aston is there to fight. And uh, three 250s are the factory team for Ferrari. That number 14 car, that was. Uh, there we go. Uh, also, as we say, the privateers, we have a North American racing team, that's uh, Luigi Canetti running NART, and this car here. So, uh, Canetti, he's one of our heroes. He's, uh, he, he drives in 12 consecutive 24 hours of Le Mans. This is incredible. Three outright wins. He wins three times uh, for Alfa Romeo in the 30s. And then again for Ferrari in 1953 with the 166. So Luigi Canetti, definitely one of our heroes here at the Simeon. And this car is owned on by his son, Luigi Canetti. So thank you, Mr. Canetti. We're not taking that out back today, but we wanted to bring it out so you have a good look at that because that is one of the cars in our race today. Okay, Aston Martin. They are an efficiently run team. They're very professional. They're small, they're, they're not financed uh, that great, not like you know, Ferrari, they'll put everything into it, so financing whatever nickel he's got is going into it. Jaguar, you know, they're selling cars, they're doing healthy, and, and they did well, but they were smart enough to get out because of financing. And Aston Martin, they're doing the best they can, and one thing they can do that is be, just be efficient, be you know, plan ahead, and they do this very thoroughly. Reg Parnell leading the way, and they have notes for everybody, instruction for everybody, where what we maybe don't know, but there's rumorings over on Ferrari, they have problems, you have some of these guys are prima donnas. Um, I think, um, uh, who's our fellow that owned our Maserati there? His name will come to me in a minute. He's upset because of the kind of race he wants, he wants to run, and the management is telling them, no, this is how you're going to do it, and such. So there's maybe a, a little uh, ruffling of feathers over in the Ferrari team. The Aston team, Moss says, get along famously. He says all the drivers are easygoing. He likes being on this team. Uh, if anybody there could be a prima donna, it could be him. 
but he says now we don't have any issues among the drivers with the management uh, nice and, and calm over at Aspen's and with good planning by Reg Barnell. So here's here's uh, part of the plan. Reg Barnell was like, Moss, your job, you have the fastest car, they give him a higher power car. You can make a Le Mans car higher power. Why? Because Le Mans is a 24 hour race. You do not go for ultimate power when you build your car. You go conservatively, uh, less stress. You need to finish this race to win this race. However, you can get more power out of these cars, and Moss's Aston is a little higher on the power end. Not only that, his instructions, he is told he can run as high as 6,100 RPM. The others are held back a little onto that, maybe 58, 5,900 RPM in top gear on the Mulsanne. Moss, he's told, run 6,000. If you get a draft behind a Ferrari, they're the faster cars to get up to 6,100. And why is that? Why do you have the fastest guy and the fastest car? Let's get those Ferraris running hard because uh, the uh, Aston team, they kind of look at like the really only chance to beat Ferrari is to break Ferrari. So they want these Ferraris to race amongst each other. They, they know they have very competitive guys in there. There are some issues between the drivers that don't want to race each other anyway. Let's throw a fast Aston in there too and, and egg them on. So that's, that's the plan for uh, our Aston team. Here we see the Le Mans start. What do they do? If you, if you see an earlier picture in the book, Moss is down like this. Moss is very often the first guy in the car and the first car away. He must be eight cars back. Many races, he's the first car down the, down the stretch. Um, he's a you know, healthy looking guy. He's only about my height. Uh, later days, quite a bit shorter. And so he's uh, not a big guy, but he's, he's well built. He looks athletic, he works out, and he's good in the sprint whether it's on his feet or in the car. So off on the first guy, into the car. So here they are running for the cars. That's, uh, that was Moss closest to us. And who gets away first? Number four, that's Moss. And uh, right next to him, Innes Island and Jaguar number three. And there we see behind in the field a little bit. So Moss away, right away, doing his job, putting that ass out front, out front and make the opposition. These guys are racers. You, you can't tease them like that. They, they have to chase that uh, rabbit. So, oh, Barra, that's why uh, Barra owned our Maserati one time. So Jean Barra, he's on, on the uh, Ferrari team, and he has a little bit of a bug about how they're doing things. He's already miffed before the race even starts, and he stalls on the line. <laughs> Ferrari's got the fastest car. Barra stalls on the line, and everybody's gone. They're halfway around before he even gets into the race. Um, However, what's he do? He's going to make that up. So he is really pushing hard. And there we have Trintignant and Ferrari in number six. So that, yeah, the front, um, that number six is sideways. They didn't crash out, but another Aston did crash out. I think maybe at the White Horse, at the White House. Uh, but here we have uh, Barra. Um, Okay, Barra. He sets fastest lap, passes Moss, Moss on the Mulsan. Keep in mind, he's in a, in a Ferrari. He's, he's got a faster car, and he is just at it no matter what. He's ignoring team instructions, whatever they may be, and he's running 9,000 plus RPM on the, on the Mulsan. And what does that do from starting out at the back of the pack, tears his way through the pack, passes the leaders, he's going hell bent, and that's exactly what. Uh, Reg Parnell running Aston team wants to see. And by the time that we get to our first allowed driver changes, which is 30 laps in, we have uh, Barrow already with overheating problems in his fast leading Ferrari. So uh, what do we have? Shades of Le Mans past. Okay, there we have uh, uh, Gregory in Ireland moving up to second place in the Curio across uh, Jaguar D. And uh, who are they chasing? Barra in that fast Ferrari. So three hours in, now we have uh, Barra, Gurney, the team of Ferrari, leading 40 seconds over uh, Moss in second now, and the uh, Jaguar moving up. So there we see it, hot on the corner there. So a Curry Cross, 9 p.m., they have a Jaguar in second. Tojiro, another Jaguar engine car, is in fourth. So the Jaguars, who of course had been winning Le Mans in the 50s, are still a potent rival. 
and what we have by 10 o'clock, seven in the flop in, and Ireland, Gregory, Jaguar in second place, and Moss and Fairman and the Aston in third place, both go out, engine problems. We lose the second and third place cars to attrition. So the race. Then third, we have the DBR1 of Shelby and Salvadori. They're playing back, they're playing by the rules. They have specific directions, how, how many RPMs can you run. So they're not running full out. They're uh, sitting back, waiting to see what happens because they know if they go head to head to Ferrari, how can you go head to head? The, the, the 58 winner, the, the, the champions, their cars are durable, their cars are faster. You would have to exhaust yourself running against them and only pray that they break. That's the only thing you would do if you went head to head. So, uh, second place tag is out. Now, then we have it goes into the lead. That's the number 14 car. So, Phil Hill and Jean Bien laying back a little bit, letting things clear out, let some of these cars overheat and get out of the way, and they take into the lead. As to Martin, they're now in second and third behind uh, Phil Hill and Jean Bien. Now, uh, one, ha one thing happens now, it's late at night, 2 a.m. Aston Martin, uh, we have the second place car with uh, Shelby Salvadori. Salvador is driving, and he gets a terrible vibration in the car. He's uh, not sure if the transmission's coming apart, uh, rear axle's blowing up, something bad is happening. He uh, pulls into the pits, lets him know. Uh, Parnell's like, get out there and, and do three more laps, because you have to do your 30 lap interval. Before and then you come in, we can refuel, we can change the driver, we're allowed to do what we want on the car, that's a proper pit stop. So uh, uh, Salvador kind of messes around, reduce spell, speed, a couple slow laps in this heavily vibrated car, gets into the laps on the, on his, at his designated time, and all this is a tire. They had no trouble with tires, but here it is, a tire that was throwing its tread pieces of tread, we're all jammed up in the car, and it's shaking us up to pieces. It's kind of funny because they come into the pits and Salvador is like, the transmission blown up, the, this or that, it's coming apart. And uh, Rich Parnell hops in the car, they have a jack up, he starts it, he says, change the left tire. <laughs> so sometimes uh, uh, you don't really want the drivers telling you what's wrong, you just want them giving you the symptoms. Don't interpret it, give us the symptoms. Occasionally you have a driver who's a proper engineer, somebody like, uh, uh, well, can't think of his name now, but yeah, sometimes you have good engineers who are drivers and uh, they might do better, but you typically don't want a driver telling you what's wrong. You just want them to tell, them, tell you what it feels like. So uh, 19 hours of racing, and it looks like it's gonna be Ferrari's day because we have 14 uh, teamed by John Bion and Hill leading the way, and the field is down to only 23 uh, competitors now at this point, and Ferrari's just, uh, just doing it and pulling away. Porsches, are holding the next four spots after the second place Aston. Porsche, that's a small displacement car. These guys are 1,500 cc's and two liters. And uh, they are running hard and like a train behind the leaders. And then after these uh, very fast Porsches who are probably running beyond where they should be, because then we have uh, four Ferraris, this car included, and the next spot after them. We have the, the Ferraris running in the GT class and if all, all the leaders break out, they're going to make a charge. So it's looking pretty strong for Ferrari. We have a lot of Ferraris still competitive. And there we see the number five car. Uh, one, one thing happens with Porsche. Uh, we have Bonnier in fourth and goes out with clutch problems. Then the, another team car, works Porsche, goes out with a busted gearbox. And then we have a, a, the Dutch Porsche moves up in the fourth and they break their engine, and, then, and we're down to one Porsche <laughs> in no time. Now suddenly we have an American entered Porsche back and forth. So 20 hours in, Shelby's closing the gap on the Ferrari a bit, but what do you do when you're leading? You don't have to keep pushing. Uh, jean V and Hill, they can run a little bit easy, so it doesn't mean that Aston has gotten suddenly faster. It probably means the leaders are conserving their car. 24 hours, you need to be there at the end. Uh, so yeah, we, as we said at the beginning when we're talking about the, the management, Rich Barnell and Aston Martin, it takes uh, some luck, it takes hard work, and certainly at the moment it's 24 hours, luck is a nice thing to have, and sometimes it's bad. So here we are, we're on Sunday, 
and a bit before noon, and the lead Ferrari is slowing down and sputtering down, and then takes off again. You know, what is this uh, fuel supply? Uh, it's obviously having some issues. They've been leading for nine hours. They have a three-lap lead. Le Mans is a long course. What is it, seven miles back then? And uh, Ferrari leading three of those laps should be in the bag, but there's some problem with the lead Ferrari. So uh, here, we, here we see, uh, after overheating, John Bien hits the lead Ferrari, and Aston Martin are, are able to make up those three laps, make up that deficit, and go into the lead. And the last Porsches also go out at this time. So uh, that's that's the way it goes at the mall. You have to be there to finish. It looked like it should be a Pillow Jean Bien Ferrari, a repeat of 1958. And uh, they're there Sunday. They're looking at the finish line. It's only got a couple more hours, and they, their car overheats, and they're done. They've been running too hot a pace. The Astons have been conservative. They're, they're losing seconds on every lap, losing those seconds, but they're running a more moderate race, easier RPMs. So we have uh, Shelby and Salvadori coming in and winning for Aston Martin. It's an incredible thing for Aston Martin. This, is, this has been David Brown's dream for 10 years. And uh, let me give you an idea about those laps. Moss had been doing four minutes and a second. That was his lap times. Remember, he's in the hot car, he's putting in the fast laps. And the other Astons are running four, four minutes and 20 seconds. So they're running 19 seconds slower. That doesn't sound like a lot. Add that up over 24 hours, and you see that those cars are running easier. And uh, that's that was the, the, the uh, Reg Parnell's direction to conserve the cars a bit. And we had, even when, when Aston takes the lead, we have Salvadori drops his speed down to four minutes and 50 seconds per lap because he was going to threaten them. The Ferraris are well back in the field. So um, they, are, they finish on a fairly easy pace. And uh, it's Aston Martin's finest hour. David Brown, in his Sunday best, hops into the winning car and goes around on the parade lap, just jumping for joy. This guy is just ebullient and totally overjoyed. He can't believe it. Uh, finally, a Le Mans victory. He's riding in the victory lap. There we see him with uh, Salvador holding champagne. That's a good sign. Shelby, take it easy. So uh, yes, it's definitely it's an earned victory for Essence. They've put in years of hard work, planning, and disappointments, but they kept their race strategy, and Ferrari was just all over the place, just go for broke. So that race strategy probably made all the difference getting this win. So uh, what do we have there? Two outstanding 1959 tribes. Nürburgring, 1000 with Moss, and now Shelby and Salvadori taking Le Mans. Could it get any better than this? Ferrari finishes third, fourth, and fifth. This car here finishing sixth. So there's a team of Ferraris still around, but they're the GT cars. They're a little bit uh, off of what the, the ultimate would be. And uh, third car home, 26 laps behind. We have Aston Martin, Aston Martin, and 26 laps, seven miles per lap. We have a, a bunch of uh, privately entered Ferraris coming in. So all these Ferraris finish. Ferrari is a finisher. If they didn't get into this uh, mad rush and competition with each other, they probably would have had a lead car up there. Hill and John Bien did a pretty fine job, but ultimately uh, they did not make that finish. And so Le Mans 59 goes to Aston. Not only that, but Aston wins the World Championship. They win the World Sports Car Championship in 1959 as well. But how about the Shelby team? Shelby's sick for the whole race. He's, um, he's racing with uh, nitroglycerin under his tongue. Team management, they don't know that he's a heart patient. Salvadori is sick with the flu. His, his teammate is sick with the flu. Uh, Trignon, he's, he's in the second place car. He's driving with a burnt foot. These cars are so hot, all the drivers from Austin is what we're saying. The, the uh, accelerator pedal will get so hot on this long race that Trignon has a badly burnt foot. He, he didn't want to give up. He didn't want to go out and let his co-driver Ferrari come in late because he had more driving time. He felt he had. He was in the rhythm. So uh, yeah, the, the Aston team does not as well as their cars. So uh, there we go. Shelby drives some nitroglycerin, but he still maintains enough energy to celebrate.
There he is with Miss Europe. And so we have Aston Martin's only Le Mans win and only sports car championship. Does it sound like Aston Martin is our hero, is our underdog hero today? You bet. But how about Ferrari? Nine times uh, uh, Le Mans wins, 15 sports car championships. Uh, Aston Martin, they, they quit sports car racing right after this. They decided to uh, concentrate on the Grand Prix, and they quit that too. It's just too tough, it's expensive. Ferrari is the ultimate com competitor. I'm talking about Enzo Ferrari. He is the ultimate competitor. Uh, we're gonna give today to Aston Martin, but if you're in for the long haul, Ferrari's gotta be uh, your horse. Uh, 15, I think, uh, sports car championships, and all those Le Mans is yet to come, so. Uh, very remarkable for all our teams here. Jaguar with the 50s, Aston Martin with their one, and Ferrari really the leader in, in this whole game. So here we, we have, of course, Dragon Rights. We have a little publication here, the year one success story. This was also um, John Barra's last race. He, uh, he got fired from the Ferrari team. Yep, he hammered his car so hard, he's running, what we said, 9,500 RPMs. And you know, Ferrari was going to take that in the accident. And Barra, unfortunately, dies just a couple weeks later in a sports car race in, in his own Porsche at Davis. And uh, also, it's one of the last races for uh, Webb, who was uh, a double Le Mans winner. And he was killed in uh, F1 race shortly after this. So um, the, the story there is you have triumph and you have tragedy. That is truly sports car racing. So that's, uh, that's kind of the end of our underdog story here. We're making a big point, a big deal about this car. It is tremendous. It's as beautiful as anything. Um, but when we talk about Le Mans, you can never say, uh, you can't say enough about Ferrari, I think. And we are going to be talking about Le Mans like, incessantly, as Will said, right up to June when the Le Mans race runs in France. And when we do, 24 hours at Simeon. So let's see our upcoming demo days here. March uh, 25, we have Sebring 65 when it rains and pours. And April 8th, crank them up, the brass cars are coming out. Those are a lot of fun. If you haven't been here for the brass cars, very interactive. We have to crank start them. You have to set all the things right, or you walk away with your arm broken. So uh, the brass cars we really love. And people that haven't seen them run, they always say the same thing. Those cars are fast. They really do go. So a lot of fun with the brass cars, one of my favorites. So uh, thank you, Sunoco. Thank you, folks, for coming out and joining us. We're going to take our cars outside and uh, have a little bit of 1950 Le Mans out back. So uh, watch out for moving cars. And thank you. Thank you, John.